morning, church. Our reading this morning is from Luke chapter 8, and if you'd like to follow in your pew Bible, it's on page 1605. It's the first three verses about the parable of the sower. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him, and also some women who'd been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. This is the word of the Lord. Church family, God loves us. Jesus is truly alive. He is with his church, you and me, through the Holy Spirit. And God is on the move. He won't stop until he finds the one last lost soul. And he is looking for somebody who will willingly follow him in every generation and in every nation. At the Congress, as I gathered with 5,000 Christian leaders, brothers and sisters from all parts of the world, and we worshiped together, I was convinced of that. On the first day at the Congress, looking around the room, a thought came to my mind. What has compelled all these people to gather like this? On the last day of the Congress, as we sang the last song together, shared in the Lord's Supper, and we were sent out, I thought, and what compels all these people to scatter and go back to every part of the world, even where our message and faith are unwelcomed, ridiculed, and persecuted. And today, as we are gathered in this room, some of us might wonder, what is Christianity all about? Who is this Jesus we Christians worship? And what does its message have to do with my life today? Today's passage was written by a man named Luke. Who is Luke? He is a medical doctor. He is a physician. He is also an accredited Historian. Friends, would you think about this with me? Physicians and historians have something in common, don't they? What is it? The success of their career is measured by their credibility. So here is what's interesting. In the first century in the Roman world in which Luke lived, people considered historical documents discreditable if they included women's names and testimonies. For instance, in his culture, women were not allowed to be witnesses in court. But in today's passage, we see Luke take the risk, don't we? In the text, Luke mentions the three women and their testimonies. Who are they? They are Mary called Magdalene, a Jewish woman from the fishing town called Magdala on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. Joanna, the wife of a wealthy Roman official named Cusa, the manager of the King Herod's palace, and Susanna, 
whom we are given very little information about. So what does that mean? Why does Dr. Luke, the historian Luke, include the names of the three women here? Just then earlier, we asked the question, what is Christianity all about? What does each message have to do with my life? I believe that each name of these three women bears a message for you and me today. This morning, I thought we might take a little break from our current sermon series, and I'd like to share with you, my church family, a reflection after attending the Luzon Congress based on the text. Is that all right with you? As we begin, would you join me in prayer? Jesus, you are alive. You died on the cross. You rose again, you ascended to heaven, and you are with us through your spirit now. Lord, you have brought us here for your purpose, which is about to reveal to us through your word. Holy Spirit, would you give us the eyes to hear and eyes to see today? May the word of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. In the name of our beautiful Redeemer and Savior, we pray. Amen. So friends, who is Mary? Who is Mary? One of the Indian Christian leaders shared this story about a young Christian lady named Lisha at the Congress. Lisha was new to a city named Chennai in India. One night after she finished, his, uh, she finished the church, she rushed to the railway to catch a train to go home. It was late and dark. No one was around. It was dangerous to be by herself at that station. And soon the train was arriving, and as she was about to board, she wanted to go home as soon as possible, but in that moment, she had this inner impression that disturbed her. She had an impression that she had to let the train pass, and she did. The second train came, it was getting very late, and again she had an inner voice telling her not to board again, and she hopped off the train. Then this middle-aged lady who was watching Lisha from afar came to her. She was very angry and she shouted at Lisha, young lady, why aren't you taking the train? It is late, why aren't you leaving? Lisha was perplexed thinking, why is she so angry at me? And soon she found out why. Lisha said to the lady, I don't know. I don't want to be here either. I want to go home. But somebody inside of me is disturbing me and telling me to stay here. The middle-aged woman's eyes went big and she asked Lisha, who is inside of you that tells you to stay here? Lisha said, I am Christian. It is my Lord Jesus. This middle-aged woman came closer and held Lisha's hands crying. And she explained why she was angry at her. The lady said she was a prostitute a commercial sex worker, so frustrated in her life, she said she had come here to the station to jump in front of the train and end her life when no one was around. She was hiding and waiting. With her tearful eyes, the woman said to Lisha, tell me about your Jesus. Who is he? 
I came here to end my life. I don't want to live anymore. But is there anything that your Jesus wants me to know? Tell me. But the only problem with that was that Lisha did not know how to share the gospel. She was not formally trained to do such a thing, but at that moment, looking at the women's eyes, Lisha softly prayed in her heart, Lord, I am with, with this woman because you told me so. Use me now. And she shared her gospel with a woman in the simplest way. Lisha said, we are all sinners, but God so loves us that he sent to us his one and only son, Jesus. Jesus died for our sins on the cross. Whoever believes in him and repents of their sins in his name receives God's forgiveness and becomes a new creation. Jesus Christ rose from the dead on the third day and is now alive today so that we will know God's love for us is true. That night, this woman gave her life to Christ. Today, this lady who wanted to end her life that night is following Jesus Christ and witnessing wherever she goes. This lady has planted three churches in Chennai, and she is the pastor of the church. Friends, it is a true story. It is happening right now in this world today. What does Apostle Paul say? He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Who is this Jesus you and I are following? Christ himself is our salvation. He is the power of God that turns a prostitute into a pastor. He turns a sex worker into a saint. Jesus transforms our lives. Would you think about this with me, friends? Who is Mary? Who is Mary? Mary was battered, bruised, injured, and in agony suffering from emotional and psychological trauma under the evil influence. Imagine what it must have been like for her to suffer through that in the first century's conservative religious culture. Mary has lost all her dignity and control along with everything she knew in her previous life. Beauty and wealth did not spare her from the evil that assailed her every hour of her life. But who came to her? Jesus. Jesus rescued Mary in the same way he rescued the middle-aged woman. In the same way he rescues you and me today. Hallelujah. What is Christianity? Christianity may be considered by the majority as a religion in its form, but there is nothing religious about it at all. Christianity is a personal encounter with the living God in Jesus Christ who loves us, who restores us, and who reconciles us to the Father. Friends, do you know Jesus Christ personally? Do you know him? Do we see anything religious about Christ in today's passage? No. Jesus is traveling from one town to another, personally encountering people, person to person. He is on the move, bringing restoration to wherever he goes and everyone he meets. And his followers are with Christ, not as a religious duty, but with a grateful heart. With a grateful heart, this morning, some of us might think that it is my choice that I am here today. No, 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 you're here today because Jesus has come to you. 
Friends, this living God is with us this morning. He is alive. He can raise you and me to a new life today. But the question is, will you receive him? Will you receive him? He is alive. He is alive. Then, friends, who is Joanna? Unlike Mary, Joanna lived a very comfortable life. She was a woman of influence, status, and wealth as the wife of a Roman official. So what is it that Joanna saw in Jesus that she chose him over her status and privileges? At the Congress, one of the key main speakers, Professor Patrick Young, shared with the audience an interesting thought. He asked the audience to think about tombstones. Most of us know what a tombstone looks like, don't we? Most tombstones have two dates inscribed on them. What are they? The date of birth and the date of death. And the professor asked us to think about what is in the middle between the two dates. In the middle of the two days, there is a little line. There is a little dash. He said, one day, as he was walking through the cemetery, looking at all the tombstones there, he carefully thought about that. And he came to realization, those who live longer do not get a longer line on their tombs. <laughs> Those who live shorter do not get a shorter line. The length of all the lines on the tombstones are about the same. What really is important is not the length of life, but what we invest in the duration of life. And he challenged us with the thought, so what is the most important thing to you? What is the greatest concern of your life? What are you investing with your life? In 1875, a British young man named Harold Schofield heard God's call to China. He was an Oxford medical graduate who received many awards. He was an excellent graduate. And when Schofield told the professors and his colleagues that he was going to China, they tried to retain him and told him not to go. The Oxford University told him, stay in England. You will be a great professor one day. We will support you. But he declined that offer, and he still applied to become a medical missionary to China. Surprisingly, Schofield's application did not go through. It did not pass for this one reason. What was the reason that disqualified his application? He did not have a wife. The missionary society told him, single men do not survive in the mission field. Don't ask me why, but I can personally agree with that. I am grateful for my wife, Gabi. So Schofield went back and found a wife in four months. Well, it took me a lot longer than that. Dr. Schofield must have been very good looking. So he got married. And he and his wife together went to this mountainous area called Taiwan in China. And he served there as a medical missionary. But in 1883, while looking after patients there, he contracted an infection from the patients, and he died. When he died, he was 32. Friends, what do we think of Schofield's life? What a waste. That is too much sacrifice, or 
What he did was noble. I admire him for his sacrifice, but I won't be able to do that. These are the two thoughts that may come to our minds. These are the two thoughts that I had when I first heard about his story, but soon I realized that the point of the story is not in Schofield's sacrifice. It is in what the doctor Schofield looked forward to. What does Paul say? He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Hallelujah. Friends, for those who are in Jesus Christ, we truly have eternal life. And as Christ rose from the dead, we will one day rise again. Heaven is our home, friends. Do we believe that this morning? Jim Elliot puts it this way, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Both Schofield and Joanna were convinced that no one comes the father of eternal life except through Jesus Christ. And they gladly gave their time, their resources, and their lives to his work so that every person and every nation may know him. Some time ago, I heard a pastor share a story about one of the members of his church. He visited this wonderful Christian lady at the hospital. She was diagnosed with bowel cancer. She was only in her 50s. She only had a couple of months to live. As a pastor sat at her bedside, to pray for her, he got a little emotional. Then when the pastor finished praying for her, this beautiful Christian lady turned to him and said these words, Pastor, please do not be sad. You taught us the gospel. You taught us that for us Christians, death is not the end. Death is not a goodbye, but a good night. This is not the end. After a night's sleep, we will meet again in heaven. Friends, of all things in this world, what can give us hope like that? Nothing but the name of Jesus Christ. Why would a prodigious Roman woman like Joanna follow a pagan Jewish rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth? Why would a young man who had a promising future like Schofield follow Jesus to China? And why would you and I follow Christ? Jesus says these words in John 12, 24, very truly I tell you, my friends, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies. It remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Here is a question. Friends, here is a question. Is everyone called to go overseas risking their lives at a young age? No. But Jesus says, my followers would gladly follow me even taking up the cross and denying themselves in this world. Why in this world you and I look up heavenward? We know what awaits us in the future, don't we? Jesus says, take heart, I have overcome the world. Lastly, who is Susanna? What can we say about her? In this text, nothing much is said about Susanna. So we might wonder, 
Why does Dr. Luke mention her name in his writing? What did Susanna do? Was she a good cook or was she a good teacher? What is it about her that Luke wants us to know about? The other day, I thought about it. And another story about this Pakistani brother I heard at the Congress came to my mind. This wonderful Pakistani brother is only in his early 30s. He's not a pastor. He's not a scholar. His job is a prison warden. In Pakistan, conversion to other faiths than Islam is prohibited by law. Only 1.3% of the population is a Christian in the country. If you are, if you are or convert to Christianity, you may lose your job and house, and in some cases, you might lose your life. As this young man came up to the platform uh, stage at the Congress to share his story, the audience in the room was told not to take any pictures or videos of this man. They said any publicity might endanger his life. This young man came up and he said where he works as a prison warden, there are 300 staff and he is the only Christian in the prison. He is the only one who is witnessing to the name of Christ and he does that very carefully. He has no name, he gets no human praise, he gets no recognition for his Christian living and witness. And he said something very powerful. He said he prays every day that he will receive no attention or recognition for his gospel work in prison. The moment people found out, find out about his faith, he will lose everything. Susanna, what do we know about her? Nothing. We know nothing about Susanna, and that is the whole point of our faith in Jesus Christ, isn't it? It is not about us. My church family, let me say this out of love. For those who are mature in faith, it is not about you. And it is not about me. All glory, praise, and honor is to be unto Jesus Christ alone. Amen? And let me finish with the last story. Can I have the musicians back, please? After Dr. Schofield died at the age of 32 in China, many people thought that his life was completely wasted. But God had a plan, and he started moving. In England, where Schofield's story was told, it set the hearts of young Christians on fire, and it started to mobilize them. Many young Christians who heard about Schofield's death committed their lives to going on overseas missions. And of many, there were seven graduates from Cambridge University to deci who decided to go to China. One of them was a young man named Dixon Host. Dixon Host was from a very wealthy family. He was from a very privileged family, but by his nature, Dixon was very shy and timid. And from a very privileged living, he was sent to the poorest area in China, and he served among 100 opium addicts. He lived among 100 opium addicts. There was no private room to himself there. He lived with them together in that small house 24-7. One day, Dixon Host wrote to his mother. He wrote, Mother, 
summer in China is very hot. It is unbearable. And I live with other 100 people in a small house. And he wrote, Mother, before I came here, I thought I had laid everything before the cross. But God said to me, there is one more thing I needed to entrust him with. One more thing God asked me to lay before him. That was my personal space. And I did. Host arrived in China at the age of 25. And he left China at the age of 85. He lived in China for 60 years. When he died, people missed him. And the people said, why don't we write something to remember Dixon? And without comparing their notes, his friends and colleagues wrote something about Host in remembrance of him. And there was this one thing that they all wrote about Host. There is one phrase that all their writings point to. And it says this. He lived to be forgotten in order that Christ might be remembered. He lived to be forgotten in order that Christ might be remembered. No name, no recognition, no praise from men, but only the name of Jesus Christ was glorified through him, friends. Let the name of Jesus Christ alone be glorified through your and my life too. But that is okay, isn't it? That is okay. Why? Jesus says in Luke 10, Rejoice, because your names are written in the book of life in heaven. Hallelujah. What does Paul say? Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord will award to me on that day. Friends, here is one thing that I saw at the Congress, and I feel greatly burdened to share with you today. God is looking for somebody who will follow him with all their hearts and with all their life. In this journey with him, he does not ask if we have finished this training or have a PhD in this. He does not ask if we are young enough or old enough. He is not so much interested in knowing whether we are able but whether we are available <laughs> proverbs 23 lord says this my son my daughter give me your heart give me your heart and i will use you friends what would you and I and we as a church family say, what is the one last thing that God is asking you to entrust him with? You and I have a one life. One life. And this one life is meant to be used for a one goal. That is to know Jesus Christ and to make him known to the world this morning with a grateful heart and with our eyes fixed on our resurrected king and our heavenly reward let us surrender our lives afresh to our savior and recommit our hearts to following him would you do that friends one day our lord jesus christ will return as he ascended to heaven 
and at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and it will start with us in the northern end of the Gold Coast. Let us give our hearts and gladly and joyfully be forgotten and live for Him alone. Amen. If you will do that, would you stand and let us sing our last song. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, precious of God. Story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. on my side and you descending bring from above echoes of mercy whispers of love this is my story this is my soul praising my Savior all the day long this is my soul this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, holy and rest. I am my Savior, am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, with His Lost in his love. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my story, this is my soul, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my soul, praising my Savior. seal your word in our heart with your Holy Spirit that as we go back to our world help us to remember this word day and night that we would know that your presence is near and you are with us Father we surrender our lives and we commit our hearts to you afresh this morning Holy Spirit would you come and fill our hearts with your presence and your love that we would know that we have been chosen by you set apart for the glorious inheritance and future for us thank you jesus for being here with us this morning and we give our hearts to you in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit we pray amen friends once again it's great to be with you 
uh, today. If you are new to our church this morning, we would love you to stay a little bit longer and meet others. Otherwise, you have a wonderful week and see you next Sunday. Don't forget 5 p.m. service. This is our story. This is our song. Praising our Savior all the day long. This is our story. This is our song. Praising my Savior.